It's good to see everybody that's made it out tonight. Uh, it's a very beautiful day, and a very hot day, but I'm glad that everybody's made it out. I uh, look forward to going through uh, a story in Judges. Uh, we're going to be looking at Judges 4 and 5 primarily. And this is a story of uh, the only female judge uh, of Deborah and also Barak. Um, but to begin, kind of recap what William has already said, let's go through it one more time because this is a continual theme through, through the book of Judges. Let's start by reading uh, Judges chapter 2. We'll read verses 11 through 23 and this describes this, basically this uh, repetitive cycle that we'll see in this story and you can also see throughout the book. So starting there at Judges chapter 2 verse 11. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baals and the Ashtaroths, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hand of the plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into their hands of the enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who, who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from, from the way in which their fathers walked and obeying the commandments of the Lord, they did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges from them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they would revert and behave more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their own stubborn ways. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he said, because this nation has transgressed my commandment, my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I will also no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hands of Joshua. And basically through the book of Judges, we see them dealing with these nations that were left and the struggles that, that they brought on themselves here. So uh, this is basically that cycle. If you basically read through this, you see this happening. You see, at some point, Israel is serving the Lord. They're being faithful to God um, for some amount of time there. And then they fall into sin. Typically, it's, they fall into idolatry. They, as we read there, they were, serving the, they were worshiping the Baals and the Ashtaroths. They were serving the gods of the other nations. And then because of this, God gives them over to these nations. He sell, it says he sells them into the hands of, of their enemies. And they become enslaved. And over time, they basically get to some, I don't know if you would call it repentance yet or not, but they, a, a plea for help at a minimum that they cry out to God for, for, for help because they're being oppressed by these nations so bad. And God shows them mercy. He shows them pity. He feels bad for them. And he raises up a judge in each one of these situations. And Israel is delivered through, through God and the, and the hand of that judge. And then they come back to the top again. And they're, they're faithful for a while while that judge is living. Then when that judge kicks the bucket... The switch starts and the, the ride goes around again. And that's what you see um, throughout, throughout the book of Judges. And by chapter 4, where we're going to be uh, looking, we've already been, you can see this cycle twice, if not potentially three times. Uh, the first judge was Othniel, and he delivered the people from the control of Mesopotamia. It says after that the land had rest 40 years. Then Ehud... Um, he delivered Israel from the control of uh, Moabite oppression. It says after, after, uh, after, he was after they were delivered from Moab, they, the land had rest 80 years. That's basically that time of their faithfulness, their commitment to God. And then, as I said, starts back again. So 
these two judges have came and went. Uh, Shamgar is also uh, mentioned there, but there's not as much really detail to elaborate there. But um, anyway, picking up, um, let's start here, Judges chapter 4, verse 1. We're basically going to read through uh, well, the entire uh, chapter 4. We'll stop and make some comments. Um, but we're not going to read all of chapter 5. We'll basically summarize it. But these two, these two chapters go hand in hand and tell the entire uh, story of, of Deborah here. So starting at uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Hazor. The, com the commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Her Harasheth Hagoyim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. So as, as I said, for at least the, the third time now, Israel's forsaken God, and now they've been sold into the hands of the Canaanites. And uh, 20 years it says there that Sisera, the co commander of Jabin's army, greatly oppressed Israel. And um, it, it says specifically there that he had 900 chariots of iron these were some real weapons basically from what i read they were i don't know if, what you would call them machetes sights something like that curved long blades on the sides of these uh chariots and you go into a mess of people with them you know that's that does more damage than the cars and the crowds that we see today and so they really wreaked havoc on anybody they they dealt with with those with those chariots and uh, anyway, Israel couldn't do anything with them for sure. And uh, so this goes on for 20 years, and it's by, by verse 3, um, the people, I think they're, they're turning back to God, or at least they're crying out uh, very much so, and, and God hears them. And just to summarize real quick too, at least me, when, when you've got a list of names and none of them are common names and none of them are easy to remember, um, I wrote out a, basically a cheat sheet here because as you start reading, you, you forget who's who and you forget what's what. So if you get lost, look up there if you can read it. You, it may help, it may not. So anyway, Jabin is the king of Canaan. Sisera, he's the commander of Canaan's army, and those are the two people we've been introduced to up to this point. So let's pick up now verse 4. It says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh of Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor, or take with you ten thousand men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun? And again I will, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said to her, if you, if you will go with me, then I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there, there will be no glory for you in, in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak, Barak to Kadesh. So now we're introduced to two more people, Deborah, she is a prophetess. She is the judge, the current judge over Israel at this time. And also we see Barak. He is the, I guess you would call him the leader of the army of Israel at this point. Or he does become that. Um, he's from the tribe of Naphtali. And so at this time, Deborah had received revelation from God, uh, direction from God to basically to ready the troops to battle Sisera um, at, at, uh, at the river Kishon there. And she, she relays this direction to, to Barak um, to ready 10,000 men, specifically from, from Naphtali and Zebulun, those two tribes. And uh, Barak gives a response that shows he's willing to, but he's only if, only if Deborah was to go with her. I'll go with him, sorry. And I guess you could interpret this a couple of ways. It could be that he was, he was hesitant, he was scared. Um, or unbelieving and basically wanted her to go as proof positive of God's commandment. Could be persuaded that way. Um, or uh, it, it also could be that, you know, Barak recognized Deborah as a prophetess of God and that he really 
would be basically encouraged by having her alongside and having you know that that person has that direct communication with God and uh, there for guidance and further direction as they go along this battle. I believe if you read through if you read through the remainder of these verses and through chapter five, you never you never hear anything, especially in the song of Deborah, but only the bravery of Barak. So either way, I guess it's not really a point of conflict either way, but there's that. Um, so anyway, Barak or uh, Deborah does agree to go with Barak per his request, but she also uh, gives some insight here into how Sisera was going to be overcome, how he was going to be taken. Uh, there in verse 9 it says, So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So it wouldn't be by the hand of Barak and by his army that uh, Sisera would be, be killed. It would actually be uh, by the hand of a woman, which I guess in those days, especially in, in battle and war and everything else, um, that would probably be the most embarrassing way to go. You can actually see, I think a few chapters later in Judges where uh, one of the kings from one of these other nations, I believe, was was about to be killed uh, by a woman and he has his he has his uh, he has his armor bearer kill him so that couldn't happen and he could basically die with honor. So this is about as most embarrassing way to die in battle as you possibly could. <clears throat> so uh, without you know any further hesitation, Barak, Barak continues to to do just as he was told. They, he goes and gathers the ten thousand men and they and they set out for uh, Mount Tabor. So let's pick up there at verse ten. And Barak. Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to, to Kadesh. He went, he went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zanim, which is beside Kadesh. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Harasheth to the river Kishon. So um, they set out here, and we're introduced to another another person in this story, um, Heber the Kenite. He's He's not an Israelite. He actually would be a neutral party in all of this. Um, he's a, of a tent-dwelling lineage of people who basically a nomadic tribe there uh, who who's descends from the, uh, the family of Moses' father-in-law. And he was living in Canaan at this time, basically under the permission of King Jabin. And uh, we'll read later that they're clearly on peaceful terms. They have no, no beef amongst each other at this moment for sure. Uh, but seeing the army of Israel move on, it, it says they alerted him after introducing Heber the Kenite. So it seems that either himself or his family, to some extent, alerted Sisera that Israel's army was moving to Tabor. And that keyed, uh, keyed Sisera to ready his army and meet them there. So let's pick up at verse 14. So they've already arrived there at Mount Tabor. Um, and now... Sisera and the army of Canaan is, is headed to them to meet them. So verse 14, Then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak, so Barak went down from, the Mount, from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots of the and the army as far as Harasheth had going, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, and not a man was left. So Barak and his men did attack the Canaanites. They said they went out and met them head on. But the, the more interesting thing is to me is verse 15, the first verses there. So it says, And the Lord routed Sisera, and uh, all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And as, as with the battle for Israel every time, it's really not them. It's not their ability. It's not their talent that's winning the battle. 
Um, he's, you know, I just talked about those chariots. They couldn't beat, you know, they couldn't free themselves from Canaan for 20 years. It's not, they didn't just muster up the talent and ability to, to do that. It was, it was God's doing. Uh, clearly, you can see that there. And, uh, but it does clearly say that Barak and his men, they, they bravely did fight and uh, they killed the entire Canaanite army until it says, till there was not, there wasn't a man left of them except for their leader, and that was Sisera. And he, I don't know if he got a flat tire on his chariot, but it became disabled, and he fled on foot. He didn't stay and fight, and he's going to get what's coming to him. So let's pick up there verse 17. <clears throat> there it says, However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. So the last character in this story that we'll be introduced to is Jael, and that's just the wife of Heber the Kenite. Back at verse 18. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with, with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. Then, she said to, then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. She opened a jug of, so she opened a jug of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the door of the tent, and if any man comes and inquires of you, and says, Is, it, is there any man here? You shall say, No. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And this is to me where the story becomes strange because you see these, uh, Sisera, he's, he's fled from Israel um, and he comes back to the tent of Heber the Kenite to hide. He had previously been tipped off by Heber or someone in within the Heber's group that, you know, hey, Israel's army's over here, they're doing this. Um, so anyway, he, he flees to what he thinks would probably be, be probably be shelter. And uh, it, it would make sense. Um, it says there that uh, Heber the Kenite and King Jabin were at peace. And it was, uh, as I already said, Heber's people that alerted him that Israel's army was gathering in the first place. But uh, he comes to the tent of Heber's wife, Jael. She welcomes him in. She provides him. He asks for water. She gives him milk. Um, she covers him up, hides him. And uh, just as soon as he feels like he can seemingly relax, he's, I'm sure he's tired from running. And uh, he passes out from exhaustion. And uh, Jael takes a, a long tent stake, eases over to him like you're frog gigging and uh, gets right up on him and drives it through his head. This was not a Walmart tent stake. You can buy those things, the plastic ones, the metal ones. You can't, unless it's mud, you're not really gonna successfully drive it into the ground without bending it. Um, this was not, not this type of stake. I'm sure it was pretty, pretty brutal. Um, but anyway, the captain of the king's arm, of Canaan's army is killed Killed by a woman there. A, a nomadic tent dwelling woman kills the, the leader of their army. And uh, as I said, to me this is kind of how the, the story is, is gets, got kind of odd. Is What was her motive in this? Why did, why did she do it? As I said, the, the Kenites were living there on peaceful terms with, with the king of Canaan. They're, they weren't being ran off. They didn't have any uh, conflict that you can read of there. Um, it, you know, it's possible that maybe they saw the affliction that the Canaanites inflicted on the children of Israel. And they, did, they may have been at, on peaceful terms, but they may have clearly realized the evil that that king was and, his, and the ability that they may you know, soon be under that same oppression too. So that was their opportunity as well to, to be free from that potential bondage. Where, you know, they could have de developed a knowledge of God just like Rahab the harlot. You know, they lived in the same country. They lived in Canaan. Rahab was from Canaan. There were people in the land who knew of Israel's God, who knew the power of God and knew that he was the, the true God. And she may have simply, she could have had that same, same belief and basically wanted to assist Israel in their freedom. Uh, for, but for whatever the reason, the exact motive, it's clearly seen that God did purpose to use her to, to uh, get rid of Sisera. 
Um, back to, to verse 9 of chapter 4, it says, For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. It was, it was the intent, and that was how it was going to happen. <clears throat> and I think we can make a point there, and it's clearly seen throughout the Old Testament, but God uses people oftentimes bad, oftentimes good for the judgment of other nations, for the judgment of, against Israel, for the judgment against other nations. Um, God uses other people and other nations to direct his his righteous judgment and his his fury against against evil. So now let's pick back up verse twenty two. Um, there it says, and then as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, "Come, I will show you the man whom you seek." And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with a peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the, hand of, and the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Following this victory, uh, Israel was able to basically overcome the kingdom of Jabin and destroy him and uh, be, rid of, be rid of that kingdom and the, the nation of Canaan for some time at least. Now let's look, uh, we'll just kind of quickly summarize the, the song of Deborah. We're not going to go through the, the entire thing here, but basically it's a, um, it's a song praising God and basically uh, recanting all the events that previously took place here. Let's, let's start out by reading verses 1 through 3. Uh, it says, Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, When the leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I even I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. So she starts off by praising God for um, being, uh, you know, alleviated from this situation, from being freed from a Canaanite captivity. As she says something there, when, when the leaders lead in Israel and people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. The people were bought in. The people did what they were required to do and they did it with, with might and it was a, a praiseworthy thing. She commends the, the people for their willingness uh, to lead and offer themselves um, and then she, she praises God all talking about His great power all the way through verse 5. Um, verse six is th verses 6 through 8 kind of tell of the situation of their captivity and then basically through the remainder of the tap chapters she retells the battle um, commends all of the the children of Israel for uh, coming to fight. It wasn't. It ended up. You can read through there. It's, it wasn't just the uh, warriors from from Zebulun and Naphtali. There were other there were other tribes that also came in and helped on this effort. And she's basically commending them for for all that they did here. And uh, we'll read the last couple of verses here. In the final verses, she she blesses Jael, um, the wife of. Uh, Heber the, the Kenite for doing her part in the death of Sisera uh, starting there at verse 24 of chapter 5 it says most blessed among women is Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite blessed is she among women in tents he asked for water she gave milk she brought out cream in a lordy bowl she stretched her hand to the tent peg her right hand to the workman's hammer she pounded Sisera she pierced his head she split and struck through his temple at her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. And skip down to verse 31. And she says, Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. So the land had rest for 40 years. So I think you can basically see that entire cycle um, in these two chapters. Um, they went through the oppression, well, they uh, went into Canaan capti Canaanite captivity due to their unfaithfulness. Uh, they, God, they cry out to God. God hears them. He has mercy on them. He sends, he sends Deborah to, to raise them up, Deborah and Barak. And through, through their efforts, they are delivered. And they, and they faithfully serve the Lord once more for 40 years. But uh, I would ask, Aaron, do you have, if you have your Bible open, could you read the first verse of Judges chapter 6, I believe? Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. So, it starts again. 
And, uh, you know, it's some application there. I, I know I, I'm sound overly harsh about it. It starts again. It starts again. Um, it's really no, no different for us. Um, and we'll get into that in just a second. But um, some applications that we can take away from this. One is that God is a just God. Whether, you know, it's, it's Israel or another nation. Um, as I already said, we see God serving justice to those people. Uh, who are deserving of his wrath for their evil, for their iniquity, for their idolatry, and for despising what's right. But don't think, you know, anything different for ourselves. And we may be, you know, we may be Christians, and we, uh, but we're, we're also just like Israel. This cycle can portray us just the same. If I was to just rewrite this. You can search your name there, too. It's really the same cycle. We do the same thing. Instead of a judge, we have a, a Savior, Jesus Christ. But we, we do the same cycle. We're just as guilty as them. We, we, we're looking back on them and criticizing, but um, ultimately we can be as, as hypocritical as anybody. Um, being that we have the same exact issues. We fall into sin. We, we basically become, we become a slave to it. Sometimes we come to our senses, um, we repent, we uh, cry to God, we, we have an advocate to God through Jesus, and we can be delivered once more from our sin, and then maybe we'll, we'll be faithful for a while, and then if we're dealing with habitual sins, stuff that we're struggling with, and that we're really not getting out of our lives, we're just going in this circle over and over again and uh we're no better than they are let's read first corinthians 10 verses 6 through 12. <clears throat> i think this is a good uh application verse here first corinthians 10 starting at verse 6 it says it's talking about uh things of the Old Testament here, uh, stories and, and other things. Um, there, verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also, temp also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So our, as I said, this is the same cycle, the same issues that we have. These things are, are written for our learning. They didn't have, you know, these examples as we do, they didn't have the Old Testament to look back into and say, oh, look at them, we shouldn't be like that. We do. We have less excuse than they do to be ignorant and to be continually and habitually sinning against God. Um, but really, looking back at this, our goal should be to reduce the amount of cycles we go through to zero. Um, we're not perfect. We're not going to to not sin anymore in our lives. We're going to make mistakes, but those need to be outliers. They need to be oddities. They need to be um, not the norm. It, we can't live with habitual sin in our lives and be delivered. We're going to be down here if we have habitual sin in our lives. That's, that's where we're going to stay. And every time you, this cycle goes, and you can even see it in... in uh, Back to uh, Judges chapter 2, um, verse 19. Every time this cycle happens, it's not like the people get better. The people get worse. Your heart grows hard. You become less, less, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Less sensitive to sin. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, you basically become numb to what you're doing. And ultimately, what's going to happen is you're going to stop the cycle. But where you're going to stop is... Here. You're not going to stop up there. As your heart grows colder and colder and harder and harder, 
and you become calloused uh, and, and addicted to whatever uh, sin you're living in. But yeah, back to Judges chapter 2, verse, verse 19. And it came to pass when the, when the judge was dead, they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers. So every time, and, and you can, you'll see it through the book of Judges, every time that cycle takes place, you lose a little more. You, lose, you get a little further out. And it's no different for us. So our ultimate goal is, should be to stop this cycle, but we need to stop right here. Be delivered from your sin and, and quit it. Don't keep coming back to it. You can't live in that habitual state of sin in this cycle and, and be, be in any good state with God. So hope that's a good application to this through looking at Judges, and I hope it's been a beneficial study for us. That's all I have prepared this evening. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to close without extending the invitation. Maybe that's something that you're struggling with, is a specific sin that keeps coming back in your life. This is what you're doing. We just criticize these people and judges for how ridiculous that is and how ridiculous it is in God's eyes. It doesn't matter what we think, but it matters what God thinks, and you can see His punishment of, of this kind of folly. So. If you need to make something right, we'd ask you to do so this evening while we stand and sing. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead. Do it. Like right now. Click on it.